Hello and uh, welcome back to another update as we cover the latest developments throughout the front line in the Russo-Ukrainian war. We start out in the direction of Novomikhailivka where the Russian forces attacked the city from the south and have now managed to get to the borders of the village at the outskirts of it from the south as well. With this they are reaching the city from the east and from the south, leaving the northern direction open under Ukrainian control but there's also been some Russian advances in this direction. So with this, we see that there's continuous attacks towards Novomikhailivka on a day-by-day -day basis, with the 14th and the 15th being the latest. The fighting taking place here is a combination of a Russian armored assaults towards the outskirts of the village, followed up by smaller infantry-based assaults to consolidate the gains that they've managed to achieve with their armored forces. While the Ukrainian forces are relying on the defenses that they have built since the start of the war with them trying to prevent the Russians from getting a foothold because as I've analyzed prior to this battle, the Russian forces as soon as they get a foothold within a city, that is when the real advances start. We saw it in the Battle of Bakhmut. as soon as Russian forces got a foothold, that is when they started advancing. And we see it again in the Battle of Avdivka where they have yet again managed to get a foothold within the residential area, and now they have not just captured the first defensive line of the Ukrainian forces, which was right here in between the western parts of the industrial zone and the start of the residential area, but they've also managed to push on and have reached three different streets here to the south of the city, and with that they are attacking from three different directions here in the southeast, this means that the Russian forces have enough forces concentrated in the area to actually spread out into three different groups. And as such, we see that the Ukrainian forces here in the south are under heavy pressure as the Russian forces storm their positions in the southeast of the city. And with this, we can actually see that the Ukrainian forces located here to the south are in danger of getting encircled by the Russian forces with their presence here to the south of Tarkovata as well as their presence here in the north by the road here of Lemontova Street. These recent developments come after the Russian forces managed to consolidate their gains in the industrial zone from last month. They spent two weeks since then preparing and building up their forces with additional reinforcements arriving to the area and recently they managed to advance capturing the initial parts of the residential zone, breaking through the Ukrainian first line of defense here to the southeast of Avdivka and entering the residential area from three different directions. The threats here to the southeast of Avdivka may not seem big because of how small the advances are, but with this, the Russian forces are currently fighting over the high grounds that reside over the central parts of the Avdivka area. The area here to the north of the line I just drew and to the south of it this is all located in a low ground area. So the Ukrainian forces in this whole area will not be able to defend properly against Russian forces south of these areas as the Russian forces would be on the high ground and they would likely withdraw to the central part of the city. The Ukrainian forces will likely establish fortified areas and defensive positions here in the central part of the city together with the citadel area here to the west and up to the coke plant in the north with the lake here to the east. The Russian forces will likely look to gain control over the forest area as well as the residential area here to the south, try to gain control over everything that is located on the high ground as well as push and cut off the Ukrainian forces here in the southeast where they have heavily fortified areas and trenches. Cutting them off will allow them to prevent any new supplies from coming to their positions, which would eventually starve them out. And that is likely when we'll see the Russian forces start storming the villages of Severne or even the citadel area here from the southwest of the city, as they would be under heavy pressure to the southeast, diverting the Ukrainian resources from the citadel area to the western parts rather than the eastern parts will the allow the Russian forces to then storm the central parts of the city. It is also likely that we'll see more Russian operations here to the south of Kamyanka to try and press at the Ukrainian forces from the east. All of this will come at heavy costs considering these are in the open fields. However, according to Media Sona, which takes the details of all confirmed losses of the Russian army, 
Actually, according to their data, the Russian losses are about half of what they were at the peak and battle of Bakhmut and in the start of the invasion. So the Russian forces have significantly improved compared to back then with the initial parts at the start of the invasion showed that the Russian forces were not prepared for a war without combat experience. They started out with a lot of losses in the first few weeks and days. However, since then they improved, they withdrew from heavily fortified areas, they started normal operations, then the Ukrainian forces started their offensive, which led to an increase in Russian casualties because they had to defend against those offensives. Then we saw the winter time where the Russian forces started storming the cities of Soledar and Bakhmut. And if we take a look here, we can see majority of the casualties were actually inmates rather than uh, normal Russian soldiers. Then towards the end of the year, we actually saw the mobilized as well, significant increase in the late December, early January. But since then, it has been fairly low, decreasing over time in average. PMC also had a lot of casualties during the time of the battles of Bakhmut and Soledar, which significantly decreased since then. The Russian troops themselves, we can see that they have had a pretty much average casualty rate since the summer of last year. Until now, it's been pretty steady with the increase being mobilized and inmates and PMC, etc. So with that, we see that there has been a slight increase since the start of the Battle of Avdivka. We can see how it peaked. The latest days haven't really been adapted because it takes time for them to confirm the deaths and so on. But we see that there has been an increase, yes, but it's far from a thousand deaths a day. It is actually about 50 confirmed deaths a day. If we say that's only a third, that's 150. Compared to that, the Ukrainians claim a thousand a day. So that is clearly wrong. We then move back south to the city of Marinka, where the Russian forces yet again managed to advance a slight bit further, capturing the crossing here between the two roads. And with this, we see that there's continuous efforts by the Russian forces to gain full control over Marinka. With the crossing under Russian control, they'll likely move northwards, capturing the warehouses and other areas here to the north. And with that under the Russian control, we'll likely see that they will continue until they get to the intersection here after which they will hold their positions and that would be the end of the Battle of Marinka completely. They may start moving further westwards here in the central part and in the northern parts, similar to after Piski, they advanced into Pervomaiske. So we see that there's going to be continuous fighting here. However, similar to Pervomaiske, the battle has just gone back and forth with no significant developments. We then move on to the Bakhmut direction where the Russian forces made a slight advance here to the south of uh, Homove where they managed to capture these forest patches. We then move north in the direction of Fedorivka where the Russian forces managed to cross the river here, the Vesyukivka river, north of Sakhli Vanseti. And with this, they are likely to start operations in the direction of Fedorivka which is fairly isolated from the other villages because the closest ones are across the Bakhmutovka river. Then there's one here to the west, Baseno, which would likely have Ukrainian positions and direct fire towards Fedorivka, which would cover the Ukrainian defenders there. But the Russian forces seem to be planning a offensive operation in the direction of Fedorivka as well as Rostolivka and Vesele, with recent advances here to the east of Vesele, as the Russian forces try to consolidate their gains here by the railways by advancing further in some of the fortified areas here to the west of Berestove. Finally, we see that the Russian forces on throughout the front line have managed to make a lot of advances this year. And we have this analysis from CNN by Nick Payton Walsh, who is their international security correspondent for CNN. And his analysis is headlined, Ukraine has had a terrible week, blame the US and the EU. The reason why he says to blame the US and the EU is that Ukraine is fighting this war based on the promise that the EU and the United States will give them ne the necessary weapons to actually fight it. Currently, there's been a very long delay on the EU funding, which has finally gone through after Viktor Orban continuously declined to vote in favor of the aid package, which needs unanimous agreement. So Olaf Scholz told him, go outside, we will vote without you, then you will you will be able to say you didn't vote for it, but at the same time we'll still get the package through because it will be unanimous with his absent. 
that happened and the aid package has gone through. However, the US aid package still has not, and it is sad that it is going to be delayed beyond the holidays. So at the very earliest, it'll be in January. So with these delays to the support that Ukraine was promised, they are suffering the consequences of that, considering that they have hardly had any supply since the start of the summer. He writes further down, the lack of understanding in parts of US Congress is breathtaking. A congressman this week suggested Ukraine should name a finite price tag and a specific simple goal. It's staring that after two American wars of choice in two decades, costing trillions of dollars that congressional memories are so short and comprehension so limited. I'm not going to go over how insane this sentence is. <laughs> So let's just go on to this part here, which is in regards to Ukraine. Instead, Kiev consistently points to past successes and future goals. They have reclaimed about half territory Russia took last year. They have damaged his Black Sea presence strategically. They have a plan for 2024, Zelensky says, but it is a secret. I'm guessing that plan is trying to survive because in truth, the most useful headline for Kiev should be how unutterable bleak the front lines are for them now. In nearly every direction, the news is grim. Russian forces are hiving off parts of the eastern city of Avdivka. Yet another town, Moscow, seems content to throw thousands of lives at despite its minimal importance. I don't understand how this guy, like his analysis is so bad. Is there no city in Ukraine that is significant? Is there no city in Ukraine that is strategically important? What do you mean the minimal importance of Avdivka? It is a city that has been fortified over 10 years. It is a city with a close proximity to Donetsk, of which the Ukrainian forces can completely disrupt the use of the airfield of Donetsk. They can shoot artillery down into the city of Donetsk. They can prevent any large concentration of Russian forces in the area. It is the strategic fortress of Ukraine. It is the most heavily fortified city in all of Ukraine. The city of Avdivka is more fortified than Kiev, than Zaporizhia, than Kharkiv, than Lviv. There's no city in Ukraine as heavily fortified in such a small area as Avdivka. It beats Bakhmut. There's no area in all of Ukraine that is as fortified as Avdivka. It is a fact. There are underground tunnels, there are heavy levels of trenches look at the front line you can see these years old trenches going on for kilometers to the south of the city that the russians have gone through to try and capture the city it is a strategically important fortified fortress of the ukrainian forces the fall of Avdivka is a huge issue for ukraine yet he claims that it is insignificant that it is unimportant it only spells the utter incompetence of his analysis and this is what the west is basing their decisions off of is this really the best they can do in that case no wonder that the ukrainians are doing this poorly because currently the whole fact of the matter is as he writes that is the one thing he is right with and that is you can blame the us and the eu because they promised Zelensky, they promised ukraine keep fighting we will arm you they have been armed, yes. They've lost those arms. They've lost those soldiers. And now the EU and the US is slowing it down. That is the fault of the EU and the US. They shouldn't make promises to Ukraine if they cannot live up to those promises. They're not giving Ukraine the necessary weapons they need to beat Russia. Because Russia is completely outproducing anything that the West is giving Ukraine. Whenever the West gives more to Ukraine, Russia outproduces that. They increase their production. They do so much to keep up with what the West is doing. Yet the West is just taking its leisure, keep delaying. They haven't sent anything for half a year, really. It's at most $10 billion, and that's nothing. The Russians have significantly increased their own budget. They now pay more than what the Ukraine is receiving from the West, especially if you take into consideration the prices that Russia has to pay compared to the prices the West has to pay. Because the prices have skyrocketed, they've gone to 300%. The West is paying three times as much for every single shell that they sent to Ukraine than what the market price was, and Russia is paying under the market prices because they produce it themselves. That is the significance. That is the difference. 
That is why Russia is currently winning with 617,000 troops on the front line and Ukraine is suffering, having a terrible week. They'll turn into a terrible month. They'll terrible. They'll turn into a terrible year. That is what is happening. And that is going to be all for this update. Thank you all for watching and have a great day.